right, uh, let's start. Welcome uh, all of you to the next uh, 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 plenary talk. So we had already an excellent uh, uh, series of uh, plenary talks and uh, it will continue through the conference. So uh, the speaker of uh, today's uh, plenary is uh, Paul uh, Vergos and uh, I'm uh, really very honored and happy to be able to introduce him uh, to you. I'm, I know him for a long time, it's almost 20 years or 15 years and, uh, and uh, he's really uh, a giant of the field of uh, Neural Networks, one of the founders of our uh, society, former president. You uh, probably know him as, uh, uh, might know him maybe, uh, the youngest, uh, especially uh, hadn't been born when he invented back propagation uh, in his uh, uh, PhD thesis at Harvard and published it. Later on, uh, has been introduced uh, again and became very popular, and uh, that is the area which is uh, very uh, thoroughly used now in today's deep learning. So his uh, role cannot be uh, underestimated for our field, and uh, and uh, but he's he's always coming up uh, uh, new ideas and uh, and how this uh, can be used for. The neural network field. I look forward to hear to hear Paul's uh, talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Robert, for this opportunity. I'm grateful to have a chance to maybe make a difference in the future of humanity by helping you make a difference. I'm getting to be too old to solve these problems. But there are many problems which need to be solved. Yesterday at the research session, Hava and others urged people, don't just follow the hot topic, you'll be lost. When I was working at the National Science Foundation, people would propose, I will do work on the hot topic. It generated much laughter in the review committee. That's not a sufficient basis for funding or for a career. Hava said, do what you love. There is truth in that. But also, try to do something important. Because in this field, humanity needs your help. You can't do everything. But I will try to give a big picture which contains 20 challenge problems. If you find one challenge which appeals to you that's important, put energy ruthless energy into really solving the real problem. So anyway, that's, that's just a broad comment. But that's why I'm here. By the way, one other reason I'm here, I'm grateful that the International Neural Network Society is still active. As neural nets become popular in computer science, there are people who would want to say, hey, this is ours, you go away. We want it now. We hated you before, but now we want it. Who are you? And what the International Neural Network Society is, is a place dedicated to a key mission, a mission we should never forget, the mission to improve cooperation and understanding involving neural networks, which connects the neuroscientists, the engineers, the computer scientists, and the psychologists. And that leads me a bit to the theme I'm going to start with here. We are living in a very exciting time for this field. Jan LeCun has called this the second great rebirth of neural networks. And suddenly, every corporate person I ever talked to is saying, do you know anything about deep learning? Oprah has been telling me these things about deep learning. Maybe I should listen to her. I said, well, if you want to know about deep learning, there are some of us who might know a little bit more than Oprah, who've been doing this a long time. It's really exciting that there's such huge interest. But the question is, why now? 
and, and I'll talk about that. This is such a big subject. There are many new things which have happened. Because there are so many new things, I am going to skip very important things I should talk about. I can't help it with one hour. But I can urge you, if you are interested in any detail that I neglected, if there's any part of the story I'm missing and you want to hear more about it, please go to this website. I, I have a lot of new things there. For example, I have a, a blog post on the new artificial intelligence. What is it? And that gives a link to several things. It gives a link to the big new symposium on deep learning and recurrent neural networks, which was in Barcelona last year. And I think for the field of deep learning and the industry, probably this symposium in Barcelona was the number one technical event last year. It was organized by Jürgen Schmidhuber. Two or 3,000 people there. Alex Graves was one of the speakers, but other people from DeepMind and Facebook went into substantive details. So, in this part of my website, I link to that symposium and to a video by Sergey Brin. And I won't play it for you, but it's important. You might want to look, look it up. Is there anyone here who doesn't know who Sergey Brin is? Okay. Okay, so I have to say, uh, he, he is basically one of the two big people, founders of, of Google. And I hope we all know what Google is, okay? And Sergey Brin is widely respected in the industry as this was the guy who recognized the huge commercial value of deep learning. This is the guy who started putting real resources into real applications, which are everywhere. I, I hope you guys listened to Alex Graves this morning because he listed a large number of mainstream applications already using neural nets that are central and critical to the business of Google. And Google has been very open about telling everybody about it. So it's interesting to hear what Bryn said. In his video conversation, he said, I didn't believe neural networks would work. We're a computer science company. And for years and years, I spoke to all the experts in artificial intelligence, the top people in Stanford, the top people everywhere else, and they all told us that neural nets could only work on small problems. They could never be relevant to the big things we do at Google. And I believed them. Why did I believe them, he said. And then there were these people from DeepMind, like the guy who spoke this morning, who showed them new empirical results. And all of a sudden, he said, oh my god, it works. And I need something that works. And all of a sudden, the whole ship turned. And that's why there's this huge revival of interest. I think there are many people in the AI world who don't like this change. But when all the money is coming from companies that want deep learning, there will be people who will say, oh, well, it's ours anyway. Let me tell you all about it. So a year ago, they were saying it won't work. And now they're saying, oh, let me tell you how it works. And it's so a lot of what happened here, though, with deep learning. So anyway, that's the, the first slide. So this is kind of an outline of what I'm going to talk about. I will talk about what the industry leaders are saying today. I am very grateful that I've had a chance to speak to some of the top executives of the IT industry this past year. This deep learning business is good for a lot of people, right? You get to talk to some interesting folks. And, and this is kind of the standard storyline I hear from the top executives today. Uh, and, and I wish Sergey Brin were one of the people I could talk to every day, but, but these are pretty high up people who have been saying this. And they're all jealous of Sergey Brin because he was the first one there. Okay, so what are they saying? They're saying the new artificial intelligence based on deep learning and neural networks is remaking the world here and now. But we also need to think of the best, the next big thing, which they say is CNN and RNN. And this morning you heard about RNN, recurrent neural nets, the next big thing. Jose Principe was just squirming. He said, the next new big thing I was doing it 20 years ago. And he's right. He's absolutely right. The breakthrough, so what is deep learning? It's a combination of backpropagation, convolutional neural networks, maybe bottleneck networks, a lot of tricks. And the thing is, uh, well, 
as Robert just reminded you, some of us were doing back propagation 40 years ago in a general form. And everything that they're using now in deep learning is a special case of this general stuff we did 40 years ago. Convolutional neural nets. In, in 1988, uh, I wrote a fairly famous paper in the Proceedings of the IEEE called Back Propagation Through Time, How to Do It. And in that paper, I cited the work on convolutional neural nets done by 20 people at Bell Labs, one of whom was Jan LeCun, one of whom was Isabel Guion. LeCun was always upset that I would cite the paper where Guion was the first author. You know? uh, and, and the truth is, a lot of this work on convolutional neural networks actually came from an old Indian guy named Levine Canal, who just was never a big publicist. But, uh, and there was work done in France, and maybe Jan LeCun brought the work from France to Bell Labs. I, I don't know that detail. But it was around in 1988. And bottleneck ne networks, I won't have time for, they were around. So what's new? What's the scientific breakthrough with deep learning? And the answer is there is no scientific breakthrough. What we're seeing is a breakthrough in communications and culture. Because before this breakthrough, deep learning was used in engineering. Engineers knew about it, and computer scientists didn't know about it. Computer scientists and AI people would say, ah, it's the enemy, don't believe them, don't talk to them, everything they say is a lie. And I'm not exaggerating. I've heard some of these people in cards, okay? It's all a lie, don't believe it, don't, don't listen to these engineers, protect yourselves. And, and the cultural gap was the problem. And the big breakthrough was not in science, but in communication between disciplines. And that's our job. And there's more to do. The job is not done. There's a lot of communication we need to work on in all directions. So I'll give some details on that. CNN, when these guys say CNN is the next big thing, I assume they mean cellular neural network, which is a kind of hardware design which came from Chua and Roska. I don't think they mean convolutional neural nets, because convolutional people usually say, but I don't know. <laughs> Honest to God, we have problems with people it's using it. What? It means convolutionary. Well, it really... It really means convolutionary. So there are ideological debates where somebody says the word consciousness means this, and another one says, no, the word consciousness means that. My belief is anyone who debates that is not conscious. <laughs> be, be, because if we know anything about language, we know that the definition of words does not come from stone tablets from God. This is human culture, and human cultures tend to have more than one definition, and we should not get ideological about it. Uh, there's more to be said about that, but for now, let's just say CNN originally meant cellular neural network. It still does, but for some people, maybe they're thinking about convolutional, I don't know. But that's not a new thing. That's The, the, the convolutional is already here. It's already on Google. The hardware, there are new things coming, which are a next big thing, which I'll talk about. There are new things coming with cellular neural nets, and certainly new things in recurrent neural nets. I mentioned this big symposium. I'm going to talk about new evidence that the brain is, quote, an artificial neural network, unquote. Now, of course, I don't mean somebody made your brain in a factory. That's not what I mean. But what I mean is that in the world of computational neuroscience, people often say there are three kinds of neural network models. But to be simple, some people will say there's the spiking, there's the ODE asynchronous model, and then there's that stuff you engineers do, which, which has clocks and has backward flows. And my claim is, based on new real-time data from the brain, when I do a, an objective hypothesis test comparing those three hypotheses, that the clock and backwards flow hypothesis dominates. The evidence strongly supports the idea that the brain is a heretic, just like us engineers. <laughs> the brain also wants things to work and does things that might offend the philosopher or the people looking for simplicity. And finally, I hope I have time to talk about the huge choice we are facing. Because I was really quite serious when I said that the decisions we make now about new information technology 
could well decide whether humans live or die. And that's why maybe I should skip over some of the other things to make sure we get to that future. Uh, and by the way, that's how I got to speak to some of these IT executives, because they are also worried about the future of humanity. If the humanity dies, it's not good for the company. Um, so, so, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about where, where the, the new surge of deep learning came from, concretely. How did we solve the communication problem? For many, many years when I was at NSF, I listened to the people who said you have to have tough, real-world challenges with real, concrete engineering decisions. And we did that. And there were huge applications in engineering. I could talk about them for two hours in, in the automotive field, the aerospace field, the, the electric power field, huge applications. But the computer science industry didn't notice, and the IT companies didn't notice. So what was the thing that changed the culture? In my view, the key thing that changed the culture was a decision by the National Science Foundation to approve a new research topic. And I'm very sorry it only ran for one year, but these were the rules of this competition at NSF. It's called the Emerging Frontiers Research Initiation, EFRI. And by the way, anybody in the room can submit a proposed topic. And if it's approved, it gets something like 10 to $20 million. So you might want to consider looking up EFRI if you have any interest in NSF funding. Uh, it's kind of hard to get outside the US. Um, so I entered that competition, not for me, but as a program director. We had debates, we had votes. Every program director in engineering contributed to these debates. And they all agreed we needed this new research topic to bring together neuroscience and engineering. That was the theme. And the theme was we try to understand functionally how can the brain perform high level functioning in learning to predict and learning to optimize over time. Okay? And, and one of the examples we used was a mouse. Consider a mouse trying to go across the field and not be eaten by a fox. There's no control strategy for that mouse which guarantees that it won't be eaten. If you want a perfect guarantee, you can't have it. It's mathematically impossible. But what you can do is minimize the probability that you are eaten. And the claim is that somehow in evolution, we have evolved the kind of brain which can somehow learn to minimize the probability of being eaten. Okay? There is some kind of optimization capability which is part of the brain, and there's some prediction capability. How does it work? Can we duplicate it? And the requirement was every project should have collaboration of a neuroscientist and an engineer to verify the functional mathematics and to connect it to actual brain data. Oops, can I get backwards here? Okay, well, I guess I'll call that a message not to say more. But if you, if you look up COPN on the NSF website, that gives a description of how NSF believed we could have a breakthrough in understanding the brain. That is a, a viewpoint on how to get real breakthroughs, where the future research possibilities are, and that was very widely discussed and vetted. And my, my opinion is it's a lot better than any other research solicitations I've seen in the last 10 years for the core of what we're doing. In the course of that project, there were several, we didn't have enough money for all the good work. Right? That's crystal clear. And there was one proposal from Jan LeCun, who was a computer scientist. So he had to find an engineer to work with. He picked Andrew Ung from Stanford. And together, I, they did well enough that I funded them. The establishment told me not to fund them. There is political pressure of many kinds, which I cannot talk about for many reasons, but there were many levels of political pressure not to fund it because it was too heretical. What they wanted to do, using neural nets to attack the problems that belong to the AI community, that's sort of stealing somebody. You're not allowed to steal somebody's territory. You know? You're not allowed to do this stuff. And people were threatening lawsuits. And I funded them anyway. In today's politics, I couldn't. There have been many changes in science in the US due to Congressman Lamar Smith. And under these changes, I could not fund something as innovative as that. 
they have their new rules for what you're allowed to do. But at that time I could, they let me do it, and within one year of the funding, what Jan McCune did was something he could have done 20 years ago, something I could have done 20 years ago. All we did was we gave him enough money so that he could take the existing technology that we already had for 20 years, pay the graduate students, develop the tricks, push, and attack challenge problems that the computer science people had been working on for decades. And, and think of the psychology. If you're a computer scientist who spent 40 years in object recognition, developing special features and preprocessors, and it's your whole life, somebody comes in and says, my automatic system can learn to do better than you in six weeks. No wonder he's skeptical. There is a bit of a vested interest in there, okay? But they did it, and it worked. And within one year, they broke the world's records on like seven really hard, well-publicized ch challenge problems. So this is how the cultural change occurred. First, they demonstrated performance on benchmark challenge problems, which the computer science world had studied for years and years and years. And after they broke the record, what happened next was DARPA got into it. Because a lot of people at DARPA want to show results, and they suddenly realize these tasks are relevant to the military. Pattern recognition, object recognition. So DARPA did a follow-on. And then the deep mind people were learning about it. Lacune was talking to the deep mind people somehow. And then, when Google started putting money into it, all of a sudden all the competitors started looking at the performance. They realized what Google had, and it became a giant flood. So that's how it happened. It was a cultural change driven by a certain kind of very visible result. The earlier results we had for Ford, those were not so visible. But these were visible challenges, and that 